if I, I might be able to uh, explain a little bit of this, David, and that some of the tests that we did um, with Katsu and showed that the muscles not only become in exercise or due to hypoxia, they pump, they become pumps. I, I talk about people who exercise, their muscles not only get pumped, but they become pumps. And they actually start putting all of these molecules out into the blood. And some of these molecules are really important for neuronal function, and especially for actually MS. So people with MS have a, what's called a demyelination of their motor neurons. It's like the outer coating of, the, of an electrical wire, the rubber, uh, the insulation um, gets uh, removed and then they're able to short circuit, which is the problem that they can't get the brain, can't communicate to the muscle anymore because the wiring is basically short circuiting. But the plasmalogens, which are put out by the muscle, uh, help protect uh, people, those neurons, those motor neurons, and, and restore the membrane function. So it's really, and because people with MS can't really exercise, their muscles never really get into a position where they can become pumped by exercise. So what Katsu can do is it tricks the muscles into thinking they're exercising to some degree, and they start putting out these chemicals, which are or chemicals, molecules, which are very important for all membranes in all cells, but especially important for neurons. And what I would think is happening with this woman is that the transient, because Steve came to the shop here and we did these tests, and there is this spike of secretion of these uh, plasmalogen molecules into the blood, which could temporarily help either her muscle function itself, the muscles, or the neurons. And I'm just amazed and think this is fantastic. You know, this really needs to be dug into. Uh, just so everybody knows, uh, this is um, uh, Dr. Kevin Perot. He's from Novato, um, California. It's about, what, 40 minutes north of the Golden Gate Bridge in Marin County. And um, Kevin and his team are a wonderful, wonderful addition to the Katsu family. Um, they do some very groundbreaking um, uh, experiments and are really pushing the boundaries of what we know. Um, say hello, Kevin, to everybody. Hello, and, everybody. Uh, Sorry, I was late. Uh, what we do and what we Kevin has done is we take a blood sample, um, then we do katsu, and then we take a post-katsu blood sample. And Kevin and his team are able to uh, document and, and, and uh, compare the before and after. Again, it's a very simple test, but the more and more we work with Kevin, the more and more he's able to share with us um, anything specific. And so uh, we have Dr. Glenn Page on the other side of the country um, in Virginia. And Dr. Page, if there's any specific um, uh, element, uh, metabolite um, that you are interested in, Kevin could really delve into um, something very specific that you may be interested in. So um, maybe what I'll do after this is I'll, I will connect um, Kevin, you with uh, Dr. Glenn Page and, and um, um, Dave Carlson, who's the um, uh, Katsu specialist who is helping this woman and others like her. He mm -hmm. and his parents who are both in their 70s will go visit Kevin next week, do a pre and post uh, uh, blood analysis. I just, if, if, I, if I can just uh, quickly share a screen of the, of the before and after results with the katsu. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe you can yeah, enable, I'll, uh, enable me to do that and I'll show everybody. Come on, we go. It's really quite remarkable. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. And, and this has never been done before in history, basically. But it, so here we have a, this is all of the results that we got from Steve's in the initial preliminary tests. But in particular for multiple sclerosis, there are molecules called sphingomyelins and the neurons have a myelin sheath. And it is the destruction of this sheath which causes uh, the malfunction of the motor neurons. 
So here we see the blue bar is before, each of these represents a, a different version of a sphingomyelin, but they're all kind of related. And the blue bar is before katsu and the orange bar is after katsu. And basically the, the take home message is just that these sphingomyelins after katsu go up by at least 20 to 30%. Some of the species don't change, but a bunch of them do in the positive direction. So then this is just the same story for other molecules as well. So everybody knows that exercise is good for us. Uh, people who can't exercise don't actually have the benefit of exercise. And you know there are some benefits of exercise that I think cats who can, can recapitulate for, for those folks. Yeah. So that, um, that's it. Yeah, no, Kevin, that's, uh, can you, um, there's two or three other slides there that all. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Me. Can you go through those two for the benefit of uh, yeah. everybody on the call? Absolutely. Okay, so, um, so actually here, yeah, so this is basically metabolomic shifts due to blood flow moderation using katsu. Uh, this is for people who don't know what katsu is. This is the analysis that we do, and basically, we extract a whole bunch of molecules and they eventually <laughs> turn into data. Um, this is a good control because it tells us that before and after katsu, your fatty acids don't really change. So this, is, this tells us that, you know, it's what we would expect for before and after katsu as far as the fatty acids in your blood go. And we, we were just pulling, we, we measure hundreds of things. Some of them will change and some of them don't. These are produced by your microbiome. Uh, and although they seem to go up a little bit, they're not significant. So this is kind of like another control. These guys don't change. Um, triglycerides don't change. The ones that actually, the most important ones, the ones that are potentially associated with the sleep effect that um, uh, Joe was talking about are, are these things called plasmalogens. Now this may be a little too small for you to really see much because there's so much on here. But basically again, the blue bar is before katsu, the orange bar is after. This is a family of molecules called, uh, they're all for the cell membranes. And this is one, one version of a cell membrane molecule. This is another one. And they're two different families. But the take home message again is that they all go up after katsu for the most part some of them and the plasmalogens here in the center are the ones which are associated with uh, maintenance of cognition in older individuals and for sleeping better and a whole bunch of other neuronal functions. So if they're going up uh, transiently, uh, you're it's like getting a dose of a bit of a sleeping uh, agent. Um, so that's the plasmalogens. Hey, Kevin, can I ask you a question about that real quick? Uh, sure. Do you find, have, you, have you noticed that there's a cumulative effect in any of these people that are repeat? And number two, if there is, um, is it additive over time and how long does it last? This is a, these are all fantastic questions. The only work that we have done with Katsu is with Steve. And so what this is what I'm hoping to do with, with in the future is we can start looking at, you know, how long does it take? Because we know that people can overexercise. Do their muscles, you know, maintain the ability to, you know, put out the, these kinds of molecules? Does it change with age, with injury, a whole bunch of things? Um, so no, I can't answer. Those are good questions. And, you know, the cumulative effects versus, you know, how long it lasts. And these are all questions that I would love to work with Steve and everyone else to answer. But what we do know for sure, 100%, is that when you cause the stress, hypoxic stress to these muscles, or if that is exact, if that's what's happening, they start secreting a whole bunch of signals to the body, which uh, probably, we don't even know for sure if, this has never been done, in, in, uh, ever in science, which is kind of weird. But everybody's looking at diseases and not just general function with these tools. So yeah, so we're going to we continue to work with uh, Steve and love to you know, have more conversations on how to get
get to the bottom of some of these benefits and how long they could last in maximizing them. Uh, what else is there? Oh, the ceramides was something that I think John, one point, uh, maybe it was you who had mentioned that you had been particularly interested, or there was a doctor that we had been introduced to by Steve. So the ceramides are actually not something that you want to have high for chronically long periods of time because they are markers of inflammation. But for a short period, they are markers that kind of show you that your body is undergoing a, a regenerative process because inflammation is associated with regeneration. So the ceramides also go up. So the, mu the muscles are doing that. And these phosphatidylcholines, you know, where the, we really don't have a ton of understanding of the biological function of some of these molecules, uh, but measuring them and finding out that they change is the first step to knowing that they're important or potentially important. So this is really totally green fields, uh, never really been looked at. Um, triglycerides uh, actually do tend to change a little bit before and after. So this potentially means, but it's different, different triglycerides go up and some of them go down and nobody knows why. So, you know, this, this, what we do get when we do these kinds of measurements is an awful lot of data. And if there are reproducible changes, we have an awful lot of questions. And so we're, we're left with some very intriguing uh, directions and a lot of work to do. <laughs> it's basically where we're at. So, and Donna, uh, so thank you very much for letting me share that, Steve. No, that's great. And um, Dr. Page, if, if after this brief introduction by Kevin and, and seeing the um, Joe and then Lucy, that was the woman um, who was walking, uh, if you have any ideas um, what direction we should be headed and have access to uh, patients who want to experiment with us, uh, not with us, with, with uh, uh, Kevin's uh, assistance and guidance, that would be great. No, I'd be happy to. Uh, Kevin, let's, we can hook up an uh, email and, and connect and uh, brainstorm that. That would be awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I had a question for, for Kevin, if that's a, if yeah. that's okay. Go ahead. Quick question. Um, I noticed that myself and my parents haven't been sick once since we started doing the, um, doing the katsu. And I was wondering if uh, any of the levels you were looking at in Stephen's blood, um, I was looking at something, I'm not a doctor, the phagocytos phagocytosis, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. The professional phagocytes. Sure. Uh, that do, is, is there an increase in the professional phagocytes and, and what about the T, the T cells and stuff? Yes, Did you notice yes. any of that? Well, we would have had to have measured those types of things at the moment. And at the moment, all we've done is just measure molecules. We haven't looked at cell function. Those kinds of assays are a bit more involved and require lab equipment and culture, cell culture and tests to see whether or not they're more effective at doing their job. Um, but that is, I think we can safely say that these molecules which are put out by exercise as well as katsu and uh, your cells under stress sort of give a overall system alert to all the physio all of your body's systems that they are uh, there's some stress and they need to get better at doing their jobs so um there's basically two modes that your body can operate in couch potato mode or hungry and running around all the time looking for food mode and most of the time, our bodies are not in the hungry, running around food uh, thing. And that's where our DNA is very, very happy. Um, it's happiest. Um, so our, our immune systems tend to shut down when we have all the food that we want to, and we're not under threat. So our, our, our systems tend to go lazy. Whereas these molecules basically tell all of our systems that there's some stress and they need to get busy. And so I wouldn't be surprised at all if there are some positive immune effects on, on the system, um, but we definitely need to look at, you know, 
what those are. There's like 300 molecules that we measure and the literature uh, we would need to search. I mean, there's a lot of work just even looking at what we know about these molecules and matching that up to what kind of function is. I think ceramides and sphinger are certainly associated with um, immune responses and a bunch of them are associated with immune function as well to both white blood cells and T cells. But what they, hard to say, long-winded answer, sorry. Thank you very much. No, it's, wait. I'm, I'm sorry. So it sounds like you're guessing that yes, it does increase. We don't know, guess. but uh, we don't know. But you know, I would be flabbergasted if you know the same signals that you know exercise can do. Uh, that because exercise is a general overall you know thing, and if basically we're dealing with the same kind of signals that exercise produces, we're going to see similar positive effects across the board. But to definitively answer that question wouldn't take too much, but it would certainly be, and it would certainly be publication worthy. The one of the one of the things that uh, I 